all for coming. This is awesome. It's so exciting. And we are just really grateful for everybody to be here and celebrate with us. I, wow, this is a showstopper for a second, looking at you all in a real theater. We came from, from CWA's conference room to a real theater. That's kind of cool. Wow. OK, so 30 years. We couldn't be here without all of you, but what have we learned in 30 years? That's my job. I'm supposed to say, what have we learned in 30 years? So it's kind of impressive. We've come full circle. 30 years ago, early on in the years of ILRF's founding, we were fighting a certain free trade agreement called NAFTA, and there was a Clinton running for the White House. <laughs> here we are again. So, you know, sadly, the critiques we had of NAFTA have come true. That's the saddest part. You don't want to be right in the work we do, and too often we are. You know, Mexican workers, they're not better off today. In fact, they're still fighting, and they don't have independent unions today. I do want to give a shout out to our friends on the Mexican border in Ciudad Juarez who are trying to organize the Foxconn factory there. It's a glimmer of hope of one of the few groups of people trying to organize an independent union in a country where that right is still not guaranteed. NAFTA didn't help bring it forward. Meanwhile, in the US, we now know what the promised service economy is. It's millions of men and women, heads of household, working full time to support a family at McDonald's. And here, I need to hear a little whoop for the fight for 15. <laughs> And I, I have to tell you, the, you know, it, there are some beautiful sides of globalization because the Fight for 15 is inspiring so many of our partners around the world. You'll hear, we get them posting on Facebook and we hear them tweet, we see them tweeting and we have them actually doing signs and saying in solidarity with the Fight for 15. And it's inspiring them because they're demanding higher minimum wages themselves. The Fight for 15 went forward and said, we need a significantly higher wage and they're getting it, it's impressive. We need to connect them with so many of our partners, with the McDonald's cropping up all over China. We need to bring them over. It would be great. So looking back over Isle Earth's history, there's a timeline in your program book. And you know, it's impress it's sort of what's striking about that timeline is how many times we've had to circle back around to do things again in order to make sure that the win we that we, the one win actually sticks. Just a couple examples. In Thailand in 1998, thanks to a, a trade complaint that ILRF brought, Thailand had to reform its labor laws. Today again, we're fighting to reform Thai labor laws because the majority of migrant workers in the seafood industry cannot legally form a union. Peru, we filed a free trade agreement complaint for reforms of the same abusive labor laws that were supposed to have been reformed back when the free trade agreement with the US was signed in 2007. So as much as we're still struggling and we're still fighting and we're tr still trying to make those wins stick, it is, one thing is impressive. We have hammered more trade conditionalities, more human rights conditionalities into US trade policy than pretty much any other country. That that regime is something to be proud of, and I think this ILRF and the labor movement in the U.S. and the groups here tonight have to be, have to celebrate that. We have to say, actually, we've achieved something. I mean, the, the Europeans have nothing comparable. But we're not satisfied. There's no way we should be satisfied because there's still not enough mechanisms out there for us to ensure workers' rights. We can't be satisfied when there's still forced labor and trafficking increasing around the world. We can't be satisfied when there's still 85 million children working who are in extremely hazardous forms of child labor forced to work in order to eat. And we can't be satisfied when there are globe-trotting companies who can pick up and leave whenever the minimum wage starts to get too high, nor when Donald Trump starts to negotiate a four cent a garment price. We really can't be satisfied when companies negotiate down prices and act like they're not responsible when their suppliers' factories burn down. So what lies ahead? We've accomplished a lot, but at the same time, sometimes you look back and you think, oh my goodness, there's so much more 
we have to keep going. We have to keep demanding better national laws and enforcement, fighting for a system of global governance. We need to stop the anarchy of global supply chains that are basically leaving so many people working 80 hours a week and still destitute. If there's one thing we've learned over these 30 years, though, it's that the key to ensuring workers' rights is enabling workers to have a voice and to be able to speak out without fear of reprisals. So we're going to keep pushing policy reforms, legal accountability for global supply chain, in global supply chains, but in the end, it's got to be about enabling worker voice. Our job is to remove the barriers and to create the space for the leadership of grassroots worker organizers everywhere. Um, tonight's awardees are tremendous fighters for exactly that goal. All three have helped us in, our, in ILRF's mission to inject human rights into global supply chains and trade policies. Congresswoman Marcy Kaptur, I'm so glad you made it tonight. Thank you for coming. You have been in the trenches with ILRF since the earliest fights. Ferris reminded us of that early on when we were planning this event. He said, oh, it's got to be Marcy. She's been with us for so long on these fights. Fighting NAFTA and now also trying to fight the TPP, We've, fighting the flawed trade agreements that are going forward. And the machinists, the machinists were there. They're among our earliest allies in the union movement. They've been absolutely essential for the fight in Bangladesh to achieve the legally binding, groundbreaking accord for, bank, for, help, for fire and building safety in Bangladesh. Finally, among our bravest partners, we honor our partners from Uzbekistan tonight. And I'm going to try not to get too choked up because when you hear their story, it really will stop you. Umida Niazova is here tonight with us, thank God. And she's representing our partners from Uzbekistan who have been and still are on the front lines of the fight to end state-sponsored forced labor in that country. I, it, we tried to get our partners who are still on the ground in Uzbekistan here, and they couldn't come. They couldn't get out of the country. U Umida has been working with them and helping them. She herself is in exile, and we're grateful that you're here tonight. Thank you. Now, before I turn the mic back over to Yvette, I want to take a moment as Yvette comes back up here. I need you to all show support for the Communication Workers of America, Yvette's union. And if anybody, if, and anybody here has a Verizon cell phone, I need you to know that they've been on the picket line striking Verizon for a month. Verizon is an incredibly profitable company. They keep making more money and doing better, and yet, why are they demanding cuts in benefits? Because they think they can. We need to tell them they can't. So thank you, Yvette, for making time in the middle of everything else. Thank you, Judy.